Super Macho Man is the final fight in the world circuit, and of all the opponents in the game, this one is my favourite. Casual players can find this fight tricky, as Macho Man's patterns can either be quick or slow down to a halt before seemingly launching a spin punch out of nowhere. But for speedrunners, Macho is the playground that has it all. He's got a fluid guard that you can sneak punches through. He's got interceptable punches to speed up his pattern. He's got random stars, random punches. He's got the body, the babes, and the ego. And a 17-year-old kid from the Bronx is going to tear it all down. This is the speedrunning history of Super Macho Man. From the very early days, there were plenty of small things that were known about Super Macho Man. He didn't have any random refills, and as long as you maintained full health, Macho would also get up with less health. There was some guard manipulation that could be done to sneak gut punches in, and even get stars, but there were really only two places that this could be done. The first was at the very beginning of the fight. Macho has a short but noticeable delay before his first punch, and this was enough to sneak one gut punch through. The second spot, I'll get into a bit later. Macho also had the problem of that after landing a couple of star punches, he would start to dodge them. And just like Bold Bull 1, the star punch would never land while he was stunned, as he would regain control just frames before the star punch connected. There was also the big issue of Macho's pattern and punch selection. It was highly random, but there was also a little bit of structure when you looked at it on a bigger scale. The fight would always open with Macho throwing three punches, which could either be hooks or uppercuts in any order. Players did notice, however, that Macho's first punch tended to be a hook more often, and punches two and three tended to be uppercuts. After the opening three punches, there was a fork. Macho could continue throwing this random assortment of punches, which became known as the bad pattern, or he could throw two quick uppercuts, the first on the left and the second on the right, then going into a long delay before throwing a single spin punch, also known as the mini spin. This became known as the good pattern. The long delay before the mini spin was the second spot where you could manipulate his guard and sneak punches through, and you would also have enough time to land a star punch or two. A rudimentary idea of how Macho's pattern worked looked like this, with this section on the right being the part where he is stationary. Before any speedrun strategies, this section was the earliest anyone could even get stars, which was after 5 of Macho's punches. There were lots of factors to consider, and this was before we even get into phase 2. Finding the fastest way to solve this puzzle wasn't going to be obvious or easy, but players had to start somewhere, and that start began in September of 2002 with D Tysonator. Simply titled Daniel T's Ultra Fast Super Macho Man Strategy, this fight used techniques that were both cutting edge, but also not fully understood at the time in regards to both Macho's guard and when he can dodge star punches. To add to this, there is also a lot of nuance, so we'll go through each phase several times, establishing the elements. What D Tysonator worked out was how to get stars earlier in the phase by landing delayed hits, which he utilised on punch 2 and on punch 4, which is the first punch of the good pattern. Before we go any further, I just want to say this about Macho's pattern. I will now refer to these two punches as punch 4 and 5, because there has never been a period where travelling this way and getting the bad pattern has been better. D Tysonator also forces a block before landing two consecutive face punches during the delay up to the mini spin. In fact, he performs this manoeuvre twice in a row. The forced block sets Macho's guard in the fully up position, then DT waits a moment to let the guard drop and land the first face punch, and then buffers the second face punch whilst making sure not to hold up too long, re-raising Macho's guard. Another complicated aspect of this game is when opponents can start dodging star punches and how to reset their ability to dodge. Macho is programmed to start dodging after two star punches, but in this phase one, he takes a third star punch for the knockdown. The reason Macho didn't dodge this third star punch was specifically because Little Mac had rapid punches, which is a property that is given only when dodging specific punches from certain opponents, in this case, Macho's mini spin punch. There were some more specific things D Tysonator wanted, such as Macho's punch one to be a hook, so he could get less counter punches, not needing the extra ones if it were an uppercut, and punch two to be an uppercut, 
making the delayed punches window easier to land. I could go on and on about how this fight works, but I promise you by the end of this video, this phase one will look pretty ordinary and completely unrecognizable. So let's head into phase two. Whenever Macho gets up, he's programmed to do his super spin punch with two variable delays. In phase two, D Tysonator gets the long delay and leads with a delayed face punch getting a guaranteed star and follows that with two star punches before Macho backs up for the super spin. During this move, Macho will perform a minimum of three spin punches which D Tysonator dodges and then performs an extra dodge which I'll explain in a little bit. He counters a bunch before launching a star punch and then performs another delayed punch for the second knockdown. The opening delayed face punch utilizes a quirk with Macho's guard. After he performs a hook or a spin punch, his guard is set into the up position and the last punch he used in phase one was the mini spin. So, D Tysonator allows the guard to drop and lands the hit. This gets a star which also resets Macho's dodgeability. After using a third star punch, you can now reset his dodgeability by getting back to three stars in the bank, which allows him to land the next two star punches. The extra dodge on the super spin punch also serves a purpose other than safety. If you begin counter punching too early, you don't get the rapid punches which slow down the in-game clock, which ends up costing you time. Now, let's head into phase three. D Tysonator opens with another face punch, grabbing a star and this time gets the short delay for the super spin. After dodging and counter punching a bunch, he launches a star punch, then another delayed face punch for one final star and launches that into an oncoming hook, finishing the fight with a final time of 116.61 seconds. That was probably a lot to take in. If we take a brief overview of the entire fight, Phase 1 is vastly different to phases 2 and 3. Phase 1 is all about navigating Macho's punches and trying to do as much damage as possible until you get to the mini spin delay where you load up on stars and finally knock him down, while phases 2 and 3 are all about working the damage around Macho's super spin. Contrary to what you might think, the amount of spins Macho does doesn't matter because the clock gets frozen until his last spin. Truth be told, D Tysonator's 116.61 was just about as fast as this strategy could go. When I checked it out with tool assistance, I found it would be quite difficult to lower the record even with tighter execution. As a first ever strategy, the inventiveness with the guard manipulation and delayed hits to get stars early was a massive game changer, as it would be nearly impossible to even get sub 1 minute 30 without them. But where to go from here? For 8 months, this would stand as the fastest strategy until June of 2003, when Matt Turk came out with the Hollywood Blockbuster. Despite its bodacious name, there wasn't all that much different from the previous fight. Turk simply took D Tysonator's strategy and optimized it for speed, and the time save was mostly because of a single punch. The fight opens similarly, but this time Turk stuns on punch 2 before landing the delayed face punch. This allows him to cut out a punch later on, but the big thing he changed was on Macho's mini spin. Instead of waiting, Turk simply had his star punch intercept the mini spin. This is an incredibly tough punch even though it's a 4 frame window, as there is no consistent visual cue to time it. Unlike D Tysonator's strategy where you wait and see what delay he gives you, Turk simply assumed he would get the fastest delay, and this cuts out the dodge and the couple of rapid punches, saving 3 and a half seconds. The rest of the fight was basically the same though. The opening of phase 2 was changed to a right gut punch and now gave a random star since a punch was cut out of phase 1 due to the extra early damage and the entirety of phase 3 remained exactly the same. Using the Hollywood blockbuster, Turk was able to get a time of 113.82 in either May or June of 2003. Another thing that plagued early speedrunners were the regional differences and this time it was even more complicated than just PAL and NTSC. Regular star punches are notoriously weak against Macho Man, only dealing 12 damage, and usually you can increase this damage by stunning the opponent beforehand. As I said before, Macho never remains stunned long enough for this to be possible. But what about when you have rapid punches? Well I'm afraid it's even worse. Because Macho's guard drops thanks to the guard rays given by the spin punches, this star punch deals even less damage, just 11, 
So how does this tie into regional differences? This game and most others were optimized for NTSC play or 60 frames per second. And for regions like Europe or Australia where PAL is the standard, they were scaled to play at 50 frames per second. But believe it or not, they had to do this conversion twice. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out has an evil twin, Punch-Out featuring Mr. Dream. On NTSC, these games play exactly the same, but for some reason, the conversions to PAL were different for each of them. Only on the PAL Mr. Dream version can you land stun star punches on Super Macho Man, and they bump the damage from a measly 12 all the way up to 19. It's a shame this completely free way to get extra damage was only available on the version with a very uncool Mr. Dream, which also had to be from a faraway exotic land. But that got people thinking. What if there was a way to land these star punches that dealt extra damage? If stunning wouldn't work, maybe there was some other way. And that's when Red Tom came up with the Spin Sucker. This move first featured in Red Tom's PAL strategy known as Schwarzenegger's Revenge, but with the help of Matt Turk, it was quickly adapted into the NTSC strategy Macho Madness in June of 2003. Along with this new spin sucker which we'll see in the later phases, the entire strategy had a major overhaul with a new route and beginning with a new move called the Criss Cross Crusher. After opening with a right gut punch, Turk dodges the hook and counters three times. Remember how I said it was more difficult to land a delayed face punch on a hook? Well, it was finally figured out that it was because of the guard raise that is caused by that very same hook. So with Macho's guard up, the 6 frame window is now located by performing a gut punch instead, and this move is the crisscross crusher. Basically, no matter what punch Macho selected now, they would always know how to respond to get the star in the easiest fashion. Punches 2 and 3 were followed up with counters and delayed hits for stars, and punches 4 and 5 had counters and a star punch each. Finally, the end of the phase was concluded with 5 individual right gut punches, getting the first knockdown at 40 seconds. There were no random stars needed for any of this to work out. Despite being faster than all previous phase ones, this new one used one less star punch, and thus, Macho is now primed to dodge on the next star punch, no matter how many stars you get. Needing the long delay again, Turk performed three right gut punches dealing as much damage as possible before Macho backs up for the super spin, and it was time to unleash the spin sucker. On Macho's final spin, Red Tom figured out that this was the only time you can land an unstunned star punch after dodging one of Macho's punches, and this deals the maximum 19 damage. Since this is the third star punch, Turk just picked up one more, resetting Macho's dodge ability, and scored the second knockdown. Unlike the previous Phase 3s, Turk needed the long delay here as well. He buffered both star punches and picked up one final star, and with Macho's health at exactly 19, you know what's coming next. Another spin sucker right into the back of Macho's head. This may be an illegal move in real boxing, but in the WVBA, the rules are a little more flexible. And with that, the record was lowered again to a minute 10 in June of 2003. To this day, the spin sucker is one of the most notoriously difficult moves to get right. Super Macho Man always spins at least three times, but you never know when he'll stop. Red Tom knew this, and his solution was either you had to guess, or react really fast. You both had to make sure you don't accidentally perform an extra dodge, and press start early enough. On PAL, you have a little more time to react, but on NTSC, with the game moving nearly 20% faster, reacting in time was nearly impossible. Even when Turk got this fight, he said his strategy was to just dodge the first two spins normally, and risk it all on spin 3, hoping for the best. Over the next 6 months, Turk would lower the record twice more, down to a 107.97 and then a 106.99. No mention of what strategy he used is listed on Red Tom's site, and due to the nature of how crazy this fight is about to get, it's hard to say exactly what he did to lower the record by 3 more seconds. Before the big revolutionary change though, there was one more strategy Matt Turk came up with in February of 2004, known as the Box Office Flop, and it yet again introduced a new move known as the Wild Woolly. In order to push the time lower, players were starting to get real creative in how they would go about approaching this behemoth of complexity. 
Turk opened the fight, grabbing a star with the crisscross crusher. On punch 2 this time, he needed to stun and then perform an awkward delayed star punch which connects into a random hook on punch 3, which is less than 50% likely. This is the Wild Wooly. The fight would continue until Turk busted out the Dizzy Destroyer punch combo, completely ripping through Macho's guard. This gut punch face punch combo can be repeated indefinitely, and the only other opponent you can do this to is the rematch with Piston Honda. Phase 2 was similar like before, opening with triple right gutters on the long delay, and then needing to guess on which spin Macho stopped on. Turk then sped up the end of the phase by landing another star punch into a random hook, and then landing a weird face punch with an awkward delay. Turk described this punch as notoriously difficult because sometimes Macho would duck under the punch and uppercut, or he would just get blocked. What was really happening on the successful attempts was that the face punch was landing the moment Macho tried to uppercut, intercepting it. As for phase 3, it would remain unchanged from Macho Madness, and with box office flop, Turk was able to bring the record down to 1 minute and 4 seconds flat. After posting up this strategy on Red Tom's site, Turk believed that this was the end of the road, and that a faster route through didn't exist. Testing at the time showed that his record wasn't unbeatable, as he had gotten a 103 using save states on emulator, but with the difficulty, awkward timings, and the luck factor which was around 1 in 100, executing quick enough to break into the 103s was potentially beyond what anyone was capable of. Super Macho Man has one other unique factor that makes it very difficult to save time on him. I mentioned before that the super spin punches stop the clock, meaning you won't ever lose time depending on how many spins he performs. But one other thing it does is round the clock to the next second. For instance, if Macho backs up at 44.8 seconds, then the clock will get rounded to 45. But let's say on the next attempt, you play 20 frames faster and he backs up at 44.1 seconds, then the clock would still get rounded to 45. As a strategy gets pushed to its limit, there is only so many more frames you can save, and if it's not enough to bump the clock rounding down, then each frame you worked hard to save is lost. And don't forget, he performs two super spin punches, meaning there are two clock roundings. Box Office Flop was potentially capable of getting a 103, but even with execution bordering on dangerously close to getting hit, even Turk would have been something like 6 to 10 frames away from saving time on his best attempts. The first TAS of Punch-Out revealed some eye-opening things about the game, and one of the biggest ones was how much time there was still left to save on Super Macho Man. Sure, fights like Bull 2 and Don 2 could go very low by getting some ridiculous series of lucky events to occur, but these were understood at the time. Macho Man was just something else. In Phase 1, he just seemingly forgets that he can attack and is completely destroyed by Little Mac. The big thing came at the end of the phase where Macho is winding up for the mini spin. Phil and Janisto figured out that by performing a guard manipulation, this causes the star punch to deal maximum damage. And not only that, guard manipulated star punches are undodgeable, so now there was no need to route around Macho's dodgeability resets. The openings for phase 2 and 3 saw even more max damage star punches used, rapidly depleting Macho's health bar. As far as this task was concerned, the opening of phase 1 was an absolute mess. I mean, just at first glance, can you even tell me which of Macho's punches are occurring where? Even I have to go through it several times to dissect what is happening. The real gem is the max damage star punches, undodgeable and more damage. So what's the drawback? Absolutely nothing. These punches are so easy to execute, it's a wonder how they weren't discovered before. Over the next three years, Turk would further refine the Super Macho Man strategy to heights beyond what anyone thought was possible prior to that task. He studied Super Macho Man deeply, figuring out why it was able to go so fast even with the addition of max damage star punches. 
Clearly, the fastest part of Phase 1 was the delay before the mini spin, where the phase ended with 3 max damage star punches and a couple more regular punches just to round it off, but the essence of what needed to be done before that wasn't very intuitive. Instead of trying to maximise damage off of each of Macho's punches, what was faster was to just get up to the mini spin delay as fast as possible while still getting enough stars. The task does this by intercepting or cancelling Macho's punches with incredibly precise punches from Little Mac. With the addition of max damage star punches, it became even more necessary to sacrifice some damage early on to speed through Macho's pattern, then make up all that damage at the end of the phase. While Turk couldn't replicate the exact task strategy, he did work out similar ways that were humanly viable at the time, and managed to set four more notable world records. From a time of 1 minute and 4 seconds, Matt Turk was able to bring the time down to an insanely low 48.82 seconds, and this was considered to be one of the game's finest world records. At the turn of the decade, there was no longer an active punch-out community, and Sinister One was just getting into speedrunning. He found the list of world records located on Red Tom's site, and was amazed at just how low the Super Macho Man time was. How Matt Turk had managed a time of 48.82 seconds was completely bewildering, as whatever he did came years after the final strategy log on the website. Sinister did have a few clues though. Turk's record was pretty close to the task time, so it seemed reasonable to believe that large sections of the fight were either very similar or identical to the task, which turned out to be a pretty good assumption as phases 2 and 3 were indeed viable. The hardest and most confusing part was the first half of phase 1, and just like Turk, Sinister also concluded that this was just not feasible to execute. There was one other very special thing that Sinister noticed that Matt Turk pointed out in his older strats. Apparently, he could hear a sound cue that differentiated the final spin from the rest, and it's not that the fact the final spin has a longer sound effect. Bismuth isolated the difference, and I'll play both back to back for you right now. I did a little poll asking other punch out runners if they could hear the difference, and it turns out, most can't hear it well enough to trust using it in runs. The audio clip also makes it quite a bit easier to differentiate between the two. Normally, I can't hear it at all. Judging from Turk's final four records, it's very likely he did use this audio cue, which I'll get into later as to why this makes sense. This audio cue was far too subtle for Sinister One to perceive, so immediately, you would think he was at a complete disadvantage as he would have to revert to guessing on which spin Macho stopped on. But Sinister found a way around this, and that was to stop watching Macho, and instead, watch the clock. The moment it started ticking, that was the cue to stop dodging and star punch. There was still the issue of concocting a strategy in order to deal with Phase 1, and with nothing really to go off of, Sinister had to create his own. He just looked at it like a simple math problem, deplete Macho's 96 health as efficiently as possible in terms of both luck and speed, and the solution he came up with was definitely different from Turk's. He opened the fight with the Dizzy Destroyer, and then intercepted Punch 1 which was the more likely hook. This intercept only deals 1 damage, but that's all he needed from it, and it boosted the odds of getting past the first punch. Punch 2 is the more likely uppercut, which gets intercepted, and Sinister also follows that up with another face punch, getting a random star. This punch is possible because intercepting the uppercut manipulates Macho's guard in a very particular way. It's not all sunshine and rainbows though. That guard manip has the downside of making Punch 3's uppercut unintercepted, so instead, Sinister stuns and lands a delayed hit for a third star. Getting the good pattern, he cancels both uppercuts and fires off 3 max damage star punches, and caps off the phase with a Dizzy Destroyer at 26 seconds. For phase 2, Sinister kept it simple, max damage star punch and a Dizzy Destroyer picking up a random and guaranteed star before Marcher backs up. He then hits the spin sucker with his clock cue and dishes out two more face punches for the knockdown. Phase 3 is even shorter. Max damage star punch, spin sucker, and a double face punch ending the fight a little ways behind Turk, at 50.97 seconds. Although it was not a world record, 
This fight was the fastest time ever recorded on video, and it holds a special place in my heart because it was the first Punch-Out video I ever saw on YouTube. Sinister may not have surpassed Turk on Super Macho Man, but ultimately, he didn't push to improve his personal best any further, as he was more geared to playing full game runs. This 50.97 would stand as the fastest with video proof for nearly 3 years, until Zalad came onto the scene. Unlike Sinister, Zalad had asked Turk directly what the strategy he used was, and it was remarkable how different they were. Watching them side by side, Turk's strat used a delayed Dizzy Destroyer for the opening, allowing the intercept of Punch 1 to occur earlier, and thus getting through Macho's pattern faster. This however did require an uppercut on Punch 1, which I'll reveal now as only being 25% likely. Punch 2 was also intercepted with an exceptionally tricky right gut punch, which has a 2 frame window to allow the buffered face punch to work afterwards. Sinister's strategy had a dodge, counter and delayed punch followed by 2 cancels, whilst Turk's strat just straight up cancels 3 punches in a row. Sinister also did more damage earlier on, so Turk had to spend more time at the end getting the final bits of damage. Despite the several differences, both strategies were almost identical in speed. Phase 2 was also slightly different. Sinister had played it safe, just going for one max damage star punch and one dizzy destroyer before Macho backs up from the long delay. After the spin sucker, two more face punches were landed to finish the phase. Turk had figured out that if you played the opening of phase 2 tightly enough, you could fit those final two punches in before Macho backs up, and if you do do this, it saves an entire second from the clock rounding. Phase 3 was the same for both players, with Zalad playing a little slower, but due to the 1 second time save from the optimal Phase 2, Zalad was able to eclipse Sinister with a time of 50.25 seconds. From what Zalad had discussed with Turk, the other 1 second time save had come from Zalad not playing Phase 1 fast enough. Just executing the strategy is tough enough, but also getting the luck was brutal, and now, it was realised that just getting it all still wasn't enough, it needed to be executed really well. Just a month later, Zalad was able to finally pull another fight together that was just fast enough to save that one second. That is, until the game decided to give an unwanted random star on the second to last punch before Macho backed up in phase 2. The extra frames from the animation was just enough for Zalad to lose an entire second the moment Macho backed up. He still finished the fight strong, gambling on a 3 spin Macho, quick dodging to save a few frames, and Zalad finished with a final time of 49.61 seconds. If he hadn't gotten that unlucky star, this would have undoubtedly been a new world record. Zalad would continue the grind, gradually getting better and better at executing the strategy to higher standards, as evidence when he got this Phase 1. Okay. Oh my god, a 25 with a star? That's f***ing crazy. I've never seen that before. Once again, Zalad had gotten the unlucky star. It's not that getting the star here in particular is bad, it's just that this strategy has three chances for a random star, and optimally, you only need one of them anymore and you start to lose frames. Except this time, the clock rounding is in Zalad's favour, because phase 1 was played so well, the clock didn't get rounded to the next second. Fuck. Okay. Because I got that 25 that saved it. Holy shit, dude! Oh my god, please. Tie it, tie it. Tie it. Come on. Holy shit! <laughs> oh my god. It's over! And just like that, Zalad had taken down one of Matt Turk's legendary records. Zalad didn't know it at the time, but he could have made this Turk bot so much easier by just using Sinister's strategy. Back when Sinister got his 50.97,
he didn't perform that Phase 1 to its highest caliber either, and if it had been, it was capable of matching Turk's Phase 1. The big difference though, was how lucky you needed to get. When accounting for the optimal Phase 2 and guessing 3 spins at the end of Phase 3 for Sinister Strategy, the total odds to hit everything were about 1 in 212. Zalad executing Turk Strat was more than twice as bad, at 1 in 578, and in my opinion, was also a little tougher to execute. It didn't matter now anyway. Zalad had beaten Turk's time, and now the definitive Marcho record had a video to accompany it. Before we go any further, you might have noticed a difference between the spin suckers in phases 2 and 3. In phase 2, Zalad doesn't bother quick dodging the final spin, while in phase 3, he guesses 3 spins and quick dodges the final one. With the way phase 2 ends and phase 3 opens, the phase 2 spin sucker doesn't matter whether you perform a perfect quick dodge or the worst possible slow dodge, you will always get the same clock rounding on the phase 3 super spin. This is hugely beneficial, as there is basically no risk as long as you are using either the clock cue or the sound cue. On the phase 3 spin sucker, it does matter since there are no more clock roundings after this. Every frame you save matters. And this leads me to why I believe Turk played his 48.82 and his previous few records safely. Because this decimal is high, it's likely he performed a slow dodge and used the audio cue he could hear. And with this, getting a 0.61 or a 0.82 makes sense. Sinister had a 0.97 at the end of his time, since he used the clock cue, which is a little later than the sound cue. Or maybe it's because brains process sound a little faster than light. Either way, slow dodging and using the clock cue will likely result anywhere from a 0.82 to a 0.00. Zalad's new record had gotten a 0.48 thanks to the tight quick dodge and face punches following the spin sucker. It wasn't quite perfect, as getting a 0.25 is possible, but nevertheless, Performing a spin sucker this tight transcends what is humanly possible with the sound cue. I would also like to add that the strategies Zalad used for phases 2 and 3 are perfect. There isn't anything faster. This is very important because that boils down to there being only two locations where there is time to save on Macho. Either cut the end of the fight even tighter, bringing the record a quarter of a second lower, or unravel the mysteries of phase 1 where whole seconds could potentially be up for grabs. A little over a year later, longtime rival Brandon De Silva managed to tie Zalad for a time of 48.48 seconds. Unlike Zalad, Brandon had cleverly made the adjustments to Sinister's strategy, lowering the odds and making the grind far more manageable. But where would the record go to from here? At this point in time, McHazard's new TAS had this crazy 22 second phase 1 that was just completely out of the question. Zalad knew he would never be able to replicate it, but it did give him some ideas. The opening was an ultra tight Dizzy Destroyer into a face punch, intercepting punch 1 which needed to be an uppercut. For this to work, you have to start the Dizzy Destroyer on the first 4 frames of the fight. This opening dealt more damage than the old one at the cost of a little speed but it took the best of both worlds from Sinister's Dizzy into Hook Intercept and Turk's Delayed Opening to get to Punch 1 sooner. With a combination of counter punches, delayed hits and intercepts, Zalad was able to pull off a 23 second Phase 1. If he were to follow the blueprint for Phases 2 and 3, a time of 46 seconds was on the table. The odds to get everything in this strategy to work are 1 in 932 if you gamble on a 3 spin at the end. There was no way Zalad was going to leave half a second on the table. This strategy looked promising, but phase 1 was still a massive problem. Zalad threw hundreds and hundreds of attempts at this fight, but getting a 23 phase 1 was harder than executing the rest of the strategy itself. More often than not, he would end up with a 24 by just a frame or two, and this would cost an entire second from the clock rounding. After months of attempts, Zalat only managed to get two fights into phase 3, and both ended up getting the long delay before he could even gamble on the 3 spin. This grind was just too brutal, so Zalad gave up on the Macho 46. Instead, he would go back to play the full game run, where he would capture the first ever sub 16 minute time, and as a reward, McHazard sent him the sexiest looking Macho strat you will ever see. 
Unfortunately, due to modernity, this strategy remains unnamed, and the new move it introduces is simply called the Stun Glitch. Unlike Soda Popinski's Instant Knockdown, which is debatable whether it's an intended mechanic, this maneuver is most definitely not intended. After the usual opening, which Zalot had already come up with, you needed to dodge Punch 2 and land a Gut Punch, which Marcho will block. This looks very strange. Why would you cancel the end of the punch's animation? This weird punch activates the glitch by putting Macho in a very strange state. It activates his stun timer without actually stunning him. Schrodinger's stun or something. After the glitch's activation, you perform a very precisely delayed right gut punch, which intercepts Macho's punch 3 which needs to be an uppercut. And because of the strange state Macho is in, this right gut punch causes a stun. Okay, so what? That seems like a lot of effort to get a stun that still deals 5 damage. Stunning with gut punches is a mechanic you can use on very few punches in the game, but you will notice they are ever so slightly faster than face punch stuns. Because it's just a few frames faster, this means you can star punch slightly sooner, and as long as you get the good pattern, this star punch lands, directly intercepting punch 4 and deals maximum damage. This new strategy didn't make the odds any better, but it was definitively faster by about a second. As long as you didn't play tantalizingly slow, getting a 23 second phase 1 just came down to getting the necessary luck. Thankfully, Super March Man is a fight that has a code taking you directly to him, so even with odds of 1 in 932, the fight would fall soon enough. Although the strategy can be difficult for beginner and intermediate players, a top caliber player like Zalad with basically no pressure to squeeze out every frame would rarely fail due to some mis-execution. Zalad's grind lasted less than two weeks, where he finally got all the luck to align on March 11th, 2016, and he ended with a final time of 46.48 seconds. Although this fight could theoretically be improved, no one else knew how to perform this strategy properly, and combined with the luck barrier, few thought that this record could be definitively beaten. More than two years would pass before anyone dared challenge Zalad for top spot on Super Macho Man. In this time, there had been no new developments. The 22 second task phase 1 was still untouchable, and there had been no new ideas to make this fight any easier. The only thing that had changed was that there were a few more people playing, and the general skill of everyone had increased. Towards the end of 2018, interest in the Macho Man IL resurged with two players looking to set strong times. Brandon De Silva and me. At the end of November 2018, I decided it was time to set an elite time for myself on my favourite fight in the game. I asked Zalad for some tips. I understood the gist of the fight, but I didn't notice that it was a gut punch that caused the stun from the stun glitch and I had been face punching for hours and wondering why my star punch wasn't doing max damage. As I started up attempts, I realised it was very likely that I was going to end up tying with Zalad. While most of the fight didn't have much pressure in terms of executing tightly, the very end of the fight did. The final spin sucker and the following face punch were two spots where you could lose frames, so I began to investigate whether there was a buffer that perfectly dodged Macho's three spins. It took some trial and error, but I ended up finding this wonky looking buffer. Two left gut punches, right dodge, left dodge, and left quick dodge. It's not pretty, but it did the job, and now I would only have to worry about timing the face punch afterwards. Even with the odds at an abysmal 1 in 932, I really enjoyed grinding this strategy, more than any other one in the game. There was just something aesthetically pleasing about the rhythm of button inputs for phase 1 especially hitting the stun glitch. Everything just felt easy. I rarely made mistakes even on the tricky inputs, and it was only a matter of time until all the RNG synced up and I completed the fight. The phase 3 odds are 1 in 6.4, so naturally, after I had gotten there 21 times, I was starting to get a little frustrated that I hadn't gotten the luck to complete the fight. Something would always go wrong right at the end. Brandon was having even more trouble, he was struggling to even get to phase 3, as the series of RNG events would never sync up long enough for him to get far into the fight. Eventually, one of us broke through. 
23 attempts had reached phase 3 and I still hadn't gotten the luck. I had become extremely jaded and completely unfazed when completing each phase, and while I still enjoyed executing the strategy, I really just wanted the grind to be over. Finally, on my 24th attempt to the end of the fight, I was finally given the luck. It is f***ing over, dude. I did it. Look how happy I was. In that moment, I hadn't really cared that I didn't beat Zalad, but I had managed a tied world record. I was a little unsure how hard Brandon had been going at Macho alongside me, but to put things into perspective, I had gone to Phase 3 24 times. A little over two weeks after I had already tied Zalad, Brandon had managed to get to Phase 3 only twice. His early fight luck was just that bad. Thankfully, on his third one to the end of the fight, this happened. Another opportunity here. Come on, man. Come on. Ah, it's not a uh, two fight, but I did tie him half and Zalad. And just like that, there was a three-way tie for the Super Macho Man world record. Of the three of us, Zalad was most satisfied. There was pretty much no way he'd come back to go for the 46.25. Brandon and I were on the fence. Both of us were sort of satisfied with the 0.48, but with the new buffer, we were also hoping to have broken the tie. In the end, Brandon asked his viewers what they'd prefer to see him do next, and Dave P sadistically suggested Don 2. I was not too keen to get screwed over by RNG in Phase 3 20 more times, so I decided to try my luck at Blindfolded Mario. It did not go well. Technically I could save an entire second on the fight with this trap. If I can play Phase 1 like within 6 frames of perfect, which is really stupid. No one's ever done it. So, just by like 1 frame or something. <laughs> It's easy to, um, to lose more than six frames. Well, <laughs> speak of the devil, there we go. We got a 20. So, so technically, I can save an entire second now because I got a 22. <laughs> Dead. Dead. In July of 2019, I had the itch to go back and try to break the three-way tie. My main goal was to get the only human possible time save left, just cutting that face punch ever so slightly tighter at the end of the fight. However, I had also done some investigations into how good McHazard's stun glitch strategy was, and in theory, it could get a 22 second phase one just like the TAS. Sure, it wasn't quite as fast, but with clock rounding, that wouldn't matter. The problem was, you needed to play phase 1 without losing more than 6 frames, something I thought wouldn't be able to be done, or at least, something I couldn't do. I wasn't even going for a 22 when I got this. This happened by accident. My love of the strategy had allowed me to excel at it almost without trying. This was a massive turning point for me. I could no longer be satisfied bringing the record down to a meekly 46.25. I wanted a 45 second fight. As far as grinds go, this one was the toughest I ever did. Although I had managed my first 22 by accident, concentrated efforts did not make them any less rare. Most days, I was putting in between 2 and 5 hours worth of attempts and usually, I wasn't able to achieve even a single 22. For me, the nastiest part of the fight was the uppercut cancel right after the stun glitch and max damage star punch. There is a one frame delay before Macho throws this punch which gives you enough time to raise his guard before cancelling the uppercut. 
This is to set up the double face punch right after. Countless times, I would take too long delaying my gut punch by one frame, or let go of up before Macho could read my inputs, causing the fight to fail. Another issue was the punch you had to dodge from Macho. Before, it didn't really matter if it was an uppercut or a hook. However, there is a subtle difference between the two. The hook connection point with Little Mac is three frames later, meaning even if you perfectly dodged the hook, that still resulted in a three frame time loss, half of the allowed frames. On the bright side, I did find another time save. Normally, you have a four frame window to start the Dizzy Destroyer at the start of the fight in order for your third punch to connect into the one in four uppercut. Obviously, I was trying to cut this tight and lose no frames if possible. The added benefit of this was that if you lost no more than one frame, you could make your fourth punch a face punch, which, because of the shorter star animation, saves one frame. Even with this advantage, most of my completed phase ones ended up as 23s, which was fine. It still gave me the opportunity to break the tie and go for a 46.25. About three weeks into the grind, I was able to complete my second ever fight. It only had a 23 second phase one, so I tried to focus on cutting the end punches as tight as possible. Dude, oh my god. <laughs> please, 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 please. I'm not doing, I'm not grinding this again. Just please. <laughs> I did not stop grinding. As much as I hated getting a second world record tie, I knew I was capable of breaking it. Months went by, and by the start of 2020, I had nothing to show for it. In just over 5 months, I had only managed a little over 10 22 second phase 1s, with none of them even making it through phase 2. With how rare they were, I had to make the decision that I was not going to gamble on 3 spins. I was going to settle for a 45.97. Yes! Was that a 23 into a 22? Just please game, I'm so nervous right now, I'm so nervous, please, just please let this be over. <sighs> you got to be shitting me. Oh my god, I got to phase 3 and he gave me the long delay. I lost a 50-50. After months of attempts, it had all come down to a coin flip and I had lost. This still wasn't enough to stop me though. Because four days later, this happened. All right, that was a fucking easy. All right, fifty-fifty again, baby. <sighs> Come on, don't f me. Of course. Losing a second coin flip hit me hard. I was completely demoralized and the fight I had once found extremely fun to execute had become frustrating. The entirety of phase 1 was supposed to be about a 1 in 27, but it felt so much worse than that. Over the 6 months, I had managed a 22 second phase 1 just 17 times, and only 2 of them made it to phase 3 where I had gotten the long delay on both. That wasn't the final nail in the coffin though. As rare as getting a good phase 1 was, they continued to get more difficult over time. The rubbers within my controller were so worn out from my forceful inputs, I could no longer play the game properly. I also managed to get another 46.48, a third world record tie. I didn't even bother to save the recording. The Super Macho Man record remained in a 3-way deadlock throughout the rest of 2020. During this time, the Punch-Out community continued to get bigger and several of the newer runners were becoming top level players. One of these players, like me, would find that the Super Macho Man IL strategy an absolute joy to execute. His name was Jaylet. Where Zalad, Brandon and I had failed to put Macho at his limit, Jaylet would surely succeed. 
In November of 2020, he quickly became a top contender on the Macho Man leaderboard, posting up times of 46.97 and 46.61, fourth place behind the trio of record holders. The only thing that could slow Jay let down was the RNG, but with an overwhelming amount of attempts, he broke through. On February 13th, 2021, Jaylet would end up tying the world record. Three would become four, and the world record was still at 46.48. There was no reason for Jaylet to stop here. He was still having fun with the fight, and he knew if he got the luck again, a 46.25 was within his grasp. This wouldn't happen within a few days or even a few weeks. No matter how well he played, he needed to be patient for the luck to line up. Three months later, on May 2nd, Jaylet would get his opportunity and he executed flawlessly. He was now the sole owner of the Super Macho Man world record. There was only one more viable time save left now, and that was to do exactly what had already been done, but do it from a 22 second phase one. Jaylet was interested in lowering the record into the 45 second territory, where it would become truly untouchable unless you possessed unbelievable skill and persistence at the game. Jayla and I discussed phase one at length, and after telling him all the details I knew, he got to practicing. I couldn't believe it, but within a week, he had already become more proficient at getting the 22 than I ever was, and this was without the frame-saving face punch. I had been completely outclassed, and from this point on, I knew it was only a matter of time. Super Macho Man would belong to Jaylet. Results came fast. Just days after our talks about phase one consistency, Jaylet found himself in the same position that took me months to achieve, just getting an attempt into phase three. With no reason to gamble on three spins, he was going to play it safe here and it would be a completely free world record, until Jaylet also got the long delay. He was still early in his grind, but who knew when the next opportunity would come. In just four days, Jaylet had already amassed nearly as many 22 second phase ones as I ever did. No matter how many more times Macho decided to give the long delay in phase three, with how fast Jaylet would be able to get viable attempts, a dip in motivation would never become an issue. Fortunately for Jaylet, on his 15th successful phase one, Macho would finally give up the short delay in phase three. Jaylet played relatively safe and managed the first ever sub 46 with a final time of 45.82 seconds. There was only one more thing to add to the world record strategy now, and that was the 5 in 16 gamble on a 3 spin, making the marcher record as hard as possible to be taken away. Over the next 3 months, Jaylet would intermittently fight Marcho as well as set other extremely strong times in other categories. A 45.25, the lowest decimal this fight could go. Jayla unfortunately never used a microphone when streaming attempts, but we can see from his Twitch chat that he was nothing short of ecstatic. It wasn't all that long ago that this time was seen as the absolute perfect macho fight, and it still seems surreal to me that it happened, which is why this comment made by Jayla might seem perplexing. This isn't the end of the story. Were there any time saves left to be found on Super Macho Man? The short answer to this question was yes. One we had known about for over a decade, but one everyone had feared. I mentioned earlier that the Phase 2 Spin Sucker was mostly a freebie. With the way Phase 2 ended and Phase 3 opened, it didn't matter if you cut the dodge tight or not. 
you would always get the same clock rounding for the phase 3 spin. But what if you don't dodge? What if you duck? If done perfectly, a duck can save one frame over a perfect quick dodge, and if you perfectly duck the final spin on the phase 2 super spin, this causes the clock to round one second earlier and allow you to break into 44 second territory. The problem was, ducking the final spin is damn near impossible. Not only do you need to perfectly duck the final spin, you need to perfectly duck all the previous spins, as the animation for the duck is exactly the length of one spin. This means you would now have to gamble on three spins for phase two, bringing the odds down to nearly one in 3000. And since each duck needs to be perfect, this involves a frame perfect down release, followed by a down press exactly three frames later, back to back to back. 10 years ago, no one was even close to good enough to do this on a record paced fight. And 10 years later, nothing had changed. The rest of the fight was already so intense, the thought of adding in 6 frame perfect inputs and another 5 in 16 was just sickening. But, much more recently, there was another time save found. In 2020, McHazard dropped his final tass of Mike Tyson's punch out, and this behemoth featured a Super Macho Man fight with a 21 second phase 1. How this strategy worked was a complete mystery, only McHazard knew the details. Unlike all the previous phase 1s, McHazard's fight managed to intercept all three of Macho's initial uppercuts, something that is almost impossible to do. It's all to do with Macho's guard timers and the slight delays between his punches, but McHazard was able to figure out a way through the timers and blitz through Macho's pattern. Just after j -Lek created the 4-way tie between himself, Zalad, Brandon and I, he asked McHazard exactly how this phase 1 worked, and why a couple of the key moves were subtly different from the way they were normally executed. In the old strategy, the initial Dizzy Destroyer could be executed on any of the first 4 frames of the fight in order to line up an intercept on uppercut 1, but with the new strategy, it needed to be more precise. You needed to perform that Dizzy Destroyer on the final frame of that 4 frame window to intercept the uppercut on the final frame, effectively playing slightly slower than before. The next punch of the fight would normally be a rather easy misdirected right gut punch, but now, it was a delayed frame perfect right gut punch, intercepting uppercut 2. This is only possible because uppercut 1 was intercepted on the last frame, which delayed Macho's guard movements to be as late as possible. And uppercut 3 just gets intercepted normally with a face punch. This is the standard 4 frame window. Unfortunately, there is nothing that can be done about uppercut 4. This punch comes out instantly with no delay, so the plan is to just dodge as tight as you can and counter once. And now comes the other fun punch. This delayed right gut punch has a 5 frame window to land, but that's not good enough. It has to be delayed to the last of the 5 frames in order to cancel Macho's 5th uppercut. Finally, after blasting Macho with 3 max damage star punches, he's left at a sliver of health, where guess what? McHazard lands another delayed frame perfect face punch, intercepting the shortest delay for the mini spin, which is 25% likely. Thankfully, this last punch can be substituted for a much easier guard raise and a right gut punch before the mini spin is activated. McHazard just opted for this insane punch for the shorter knockdown animation. After all the dust had cleared, there was a clear and obvious path to bringing Macho below 45 seconds. The triple duck strategy which brought the odds down to nearly 1 in 3000 and added 6 frame perfect inputs? Or the TAS phase 1 which only brought the odds down to about 1 in 1250 and only 3 frame perfect inputs? It was time for the world's best to learn the TAS strategy. During j rise to Super Macho Man dominance, Brandon De Silva had also been quietly working on grabbing his own 45 second fight. How much focus he had been putting on the project and if he ever managed a 45 is unknown, but with j -Lek quickly perfecting the stun glitch strategy, it's likely he discontinued the Macho grind and focused on other fights. Interest in the Macho IL died down for nearly a year after j -Lek achieved the 45.25, but it resurged in late 2022, as both Brandon and j -Lek were able to replicate the TAS Phase 1 from save states. 
It seemed like it was going to be a two horse race for the first ever 44 second macho fight, but it wasn't. Although he grinded for the 44 for a little while, ultimately, Jaylet would lose motivation as he had completely burnt himself out and never recovered. Brandon on the other hand was fresh, cycling through the many fights he was already a monster at, motivated as ever to set new world records on any fight he could. Over the course of a year, Brandon would chip away at Macho, playing enough to never let rust build up, but never too much as to get burnt out. The fight he wanted to get was not going to happen overnight. While the in-depth details of his grind are a mystery, on September 7th, 2023, Brandon would post the fruits of his labor and we were all greeted with a brand new world record. Let's go, world record attack. Come on, man. Just give me love. Oh, we have it. I have a shot. I have a shot to finally end this fight. Come on. Come on. Yeah! World record! Woo! Finally! Finally! I did it, Jenny! I did it, babe! Not worry, but good enough. Good enough! Good enough. After powering through the abysmal luck he had gotten on his grind, Brandon had seemingly skipped going for a safe phase 3, going straight for the 3-spin gamble and having it finally pay off after nearly a year's worth of attempts. The final time of 44.61 was perhaps not exactly what Brandon was hoping for. After making it over every RNG hurdle, he delayed the second to last phase punch just a little longer than he would have liked making it absolutely certain he would not punch too early. But as Brandon said, this time was good enough. As of April 2024, Brandon's 44.61 remains the only fight to go below 45 seconds, despite Macho Man still receiving a bit of attention at the top level. A new player, Dr. Felix, has been the only other player to complete a fight with the TAS Phase 1. Although, he did play phase 3 safe, not gambling on 3 spins, and ended up with the final time of 45 seconds flat. That's not all though. The TAS phase 1 and the triple perfect duck phase 2 are not mutually exclusive strategies. So in theory, a time below 44 seconds is possible, which is what Mikasa's TAS achieves with a time of 43.25 seconds. Some work has been put into mastering it, but it has earned its place to be the last implemented strategy due to its difficulty. Most notably, three people have pulled it off from a save state. Summoning Salt was the first to do it two or three years ago whilst messing around for an hour, showing that it was possible, and much more recently, both Dr. Felix and Funkmeister have put in quite a bit of work into dedicated practice, getting a strong feel for the rhythm of the inputs. Super Macho Man is a fight with a rich history of puzzle solving, strategy finding, and ingenuity to get the record where it is today, and it seems like there is still more that we mortals can squeeze out of it. With a fight this fun to execute a variety of strategies on, it has earned its place near the top of Mike Tyson's Punch-Out's most prestigious records. Thanks for watching.